you personally is. <laughs> no. He said, say hello. <laughs> I, I, I really don't know much Emerson. He's lived here a long time, but I really I really don't know him. He worked in the Kettle Mountain News, but Yeah, for a long time. He's really nice. I'm glad he's there. Um I I don't know. I was so surprised when I saw him one morning over in the on the lawn. I said, What are you doing over here? He says, I work here and I went on and he went on and that's all we said. We have to speak nicely about him because he could be transcribing. <laughs> well, he, he's really a very pleasant person. Yeah, he is. And his wife seems to be a very, very pleasant too. I've got into something, Janice, I don't know one thing about. Oh, what? And that's the secretary of Middletown Senior Citizens Club. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know anything about the programs. I, I'm, I'm as dumb and as innocent as <laughs> Talk to Bill, he'll fill you in. He knows everything about that. Well, of course, he, his wife, I guess, I guess she was secretary since the club started. I don't know. Right. But <laughs> when the senior mills started over in Argyll, they said, that would be nice to go to the senior mills. I said, no. They said, why? I said, I don't want to go over there with all those old folks. <laughs> Although I am one, and I don't want to go with them. <laughs> I said, I'd rather be with my kids. Well, uh, it, it is very good. Uh, I, I've never found a meal that you really could find fault with. I don't go very often. Uh -huh. Well, what I do dislike is some of them just staying away, but that night, like uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas time, they just flock in, you know? Yeah. And they have such an influx. Yeah. That day, it, it isn't quite, it, isn't, it don't make a good showing for the, for the site, you know, uh -huh. in a way. What I mean to say is it means, well, nobody's interested only on certain days. I know Peg called me for Thanksgiving. She says, aren't you coming over for Thanksgiving that would be? I says, no, Peg, I got two daughters. I'll be with one of them somewhere. Uh-huh. And, um... Well, I guess those people don't have any, any place to go, really. Well, a lot of them do, but oh. it's, a good, uh, it's a good meal. I see. And uh, they get it. They get it cheap. <laughs> That's what they're looking for. Something cheap. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know what we all do that. And it's where do you live, honey? I live up at the old creamery. Oh, on, um, on the 28th. Mm -hmm. you know, there's apartments in there. Now. How are they? They're all right. Well, what's the heat? Great. What's the heat you get in them? I have um, a blower like you do, and I have a wood stove too. Well, you see, I had to get, I had a wood stove, combination wood and gas in my kitchen. Uh -huh. But, uh, Janice, I had to, I made it for, I had to get rid of the wood stove because I couldn't carry wood. When it comes snow and ice, fall yeah. down, break your... I find it hard to carry now. <laughs> mm -hmm. I know what you mean. But I just got a gas bill from Agway. I just went from the whole thing for something like two hundred. Oh, for goodness sake. I called them up and I said, this can't be right. And they said, no, no, it is. It's you know, it's right. And finally, I got them down there to come and look at it. And they didn't realize that my apartment was metered. So they were filling up this enormous tank full of propane and charging me for it. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, it was heating like half the building. Oh, my goodness. So now my, I talked to them this morning and my bill is down to $20. Well, because uh, I find my gas really cheaper, the cheapest of anything. Of course, what we've got here, I've got steam heat, I've converted to coal burner to, to, yeah. to um, oil. Uh -huh. And of course, when I had to, when I had to do something in the kitchen, our wood fire, our coal, our, our furnace didn't go to the kitchen because when this house was built. There was no electricity left our roof. They had to have wood to cook with. Oh, really? How old was the house? It was built in 22. Oh. And there was no, and there was no electricity left our roof, so they had wood. And naturally, they didn't put a, 
a, a vent in the kitchen or a radiator in the kitchen for steam because they had fire, they didn't need it. Right. Well, when it comes when it comes to me having to carry wood by myself, I went to Agway because I really didn't use my head very well. I don't think very good. I went to Agway about a new furnace and putting a duct uh, yeah. ready in the kitchen. And they wanted $10,000 to put a new furnace in. Of course, they, wow. uh, of course, they would have to have new radiators, new pipes, and everything. And of course, what I've got is pipes lined with asbestos. Even pipes are lined with asbestos. Uh -huh. And who are you going to get to? Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> take them down. <laughs> So I just, then the next best thing, I said, oh, shucks, I don't have to much ahead of me. I'll have to let somebody else worry about the heat in the kitchen. So I put this in, but I don't know. I'm, it, it is the cheapest piece of it, so it's cheaper yeah. than oil, a great deal cheaper than oil. Yeah. And of course, we, ever since we converted the furnace into a two an oil burner, we didn't run the water through the furnace to have hot water. We put in a gas hot water heater. Uh -huh. And uh, so I was using gas and wood and oil. <laughs> <My goodness>. <laughs> <laughs> but of course we had our wood, Dennis. We had our own wood. Uh -huh. But now I have to buy it. Of course at one time my husband's parents owned this whole mountainside. Oh, they did? Yeah, they own the old family where you are. Harold's parents. Oh. My husband's parents. And what was their, their garrison? garrison? Mm -hmm. When did they own this the Well, they come here to live from Big India in 1922 uh -huh. and built a house, uh -huh. Carol's parents. And um, they owned it then. Of course, Harold's mother was a Molino. A what? A Molino. I don't know what that means. Uh, her, her maiden name was a Molino. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Her maiden name was Molino. Okay. And of course, it was her brother who owned these owned the mountainside and owned the old Fairview and she was the only heir. So it thought it was heir to her. You see, I mean, it was up to her. Uh -huh. And then when Harold's brother Marvin bought the hardware store in Margaro, which is weeks is now, uh -huh. okay. um, Father Garrison, Harold's father, let Morgan use the old Fairview as chattel on the mortgage. Oh. And of course he lost the store, so they lost the Oh. They lost the building, you see. Oh, my goodness. My, my Harold's father and mother were married in the old fairy. Wow. And then uh, where the library is, where the bay window is. Um, I think you said that must have been something. Oh, it was, it was a house. Uh, well, I tell you, of course, um, I don't know how Mother Garrison's brother went in partners with Mrs. Um, Longyear. Because she was, she she owned the building. Mrs. Longmire owned the earth house, uh -huh. and she ran it as a boarding house. Oh. And she went under, and he picked it up. Uh -huh. Harold's uncle uh -huh. picked it up. That's how they come together. Uh -huh. But it was a beautiful thing when she owned it. it was full of antiques. Oh, of course. Yeah. And then then Seeger Fairburn. Well, yeah, Mr. Er, Mr. Earth bought it. Of course, oh. Seeger bought it in his name. Seeger bought it in his name, but it was for Mr. Earth, because oh. when Mr. Earth wanted it and buy it in his name, they just took the price right out and on. Seeger bought it. Oh, that was I what that to... was done for. Oh, my goodness. I worked for Mr. Earth for about 20 years. Did you really? At the estate? I haven't been there. Yeah, well, I worked for his mother uh -huh. for about 10 years. Of course, she was a radical, you know. I mean, was she? She didn't know. At the time I worked for her, sometimes she knew and sometimes she didn't. Okay. And um, I went in the morning when she'd go to church. Uh, they picked me up in the morning on the way back from church. And I'd go get her breakfast and her lunch mm -hmm. and, you know, tidy up the house and dust and so on and so forth. And at 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock, I'd always come home. She didn't want me no more. She said, you go home, Everything, and I don't want you anymore today. I don't need you anymore today, and that's the way it was, you know. And uh, that went on for about ten years. Someday she gets so mad at me, she says, you go home. I don't want you anymore. So I come home for two or three days. The first thing I know, she'd be back for me to come and get her breakfast and go out. Oh, my goodness. And then after his mother died, 
I worked for him in the house. I cooked. Uh -huh. Mrs. Rosa up here had the job, and her mother got sick and had to go home. And Mr. Earp called me from New York to come and cook for him. Wow. So I, I, I worked, and then after he got married, I cooked too. Uh -huh. But then she remarried. Yeah. And that everything went kaput. Oh, really? Kaput. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, they're not up here very much, I don't think. I don't know. I, I don't know the car when it goes by, Janice. I have no idea. Uh -huh. Cornelia, a year ago, I was coming out of the library, and this young lady said, Hello, Everdeen, how are you? I said, I'm very fine, thank you, but I don't know who you are. And she said, I know you don't know me because I met you on the street in Margaret yesterday and you didn't speak to me. <laughs> oh, I looked at this as Cornelia. She has eyes of, I call them green eyes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she's a pretty little thing. And yeah. she says, yes, I'm Cornelia. Well, I said, I'm oh, was that a, a daughter then? That was a daughter. Oh, okay. I said, well, I'm awfully glad you spoke to me, Cornelia, because I wouldn't know you. Uh -huh. And uh, the kids used to always come and say hello to me up until a couple of summers ago, and they don't stop anymore. They're kind of outgrown, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I used to read to them. And, oh, really? And her father was reading one time. The bad, the big bad wolf. Yeah. And she said, Daddy, you don't read it like Everdeen. I'm going to call Everdeen to read it for me. Uh, <laughs> that's great. Oh, the kids were, they were lovely children. Uh -huh. Tommy and Camille are lovely little children. Uh -huh. But I don't know what they are. Of course, I think she's in, in college. At, well, at the ladies' part of Columbia. What do they call it? Uh, Bard College, Barnard or Bard something. Uh -huh. I think she's in the lady section of Columbia. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But, oh, the place over here, I guess, is all gone to pop. Were you ever down in the maze? No, I, w I wanted to see. But they well, don't get lost to it. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I've heard. I, um, Mr. Earp came in one night for supper. He was awfully late, at 9 o'clock. He came in the last way, and he said, I'll be right down there with you. Well, I said, we're keeping supper. We're keeping dinner, right? Uh, uh -huh. He laughed, and he said, I said, I know where you were. He said, yeah, well, don't tell anybody. I said, no, because I couldn't get out of there the other day either. <laughs> he got lost in his own name. All right. It's, it's very complicated. Uh -huh. I don't think I could go through it now. I did. I could. Uh -huh. But I don't think I could do that. Well, it's quite the same. I have, I have a book, the author who, who wrote the book, author, he was over there, the one that designed the maze and so on, and very good. An English person? He was English, yeah. yeah. Very, very demanding. Yeah. Very, very demanding. Very, very aggravating. <laughs> <laughs> What did your husband do? Well, when Harold and I were married in 1928, he was a cauliflower grower. At that time, cauliflower was very, was a very prominent crop to raise for catfish. Uh -huh. And he had a crepe mill. He made the crepes, you know, for oh, the cauliflower. Right. So we raised cauliflower in the summertime and made crepes in the wintertime. Oh. Uh -huh. And, of course, we, that operation went through until Agway down here or was the GLF at the time came and they sold crates too. It got to be such a prominent crop. Oh, no. and all. Uh, and of course they undersold sold us all the time. We couldn't keep going in the crate business. Yeah. And then the war came and of course we had our big trucks to truck cauliflower into the market. Uh huh. We went to trucking business more or less by chance. Of course, I mean it was conditions of the country. Yeah. And uh, where the railway laundromat is was a feed store. Oh, uh -huh. And Harold Truck feeds in from Walton uh -huh. for the feed store. And that was every day, sometimes three trips to Walton a day to get the feed uh -huh. was necessary. Because then Drybrook and all the, all the farms around were raising, had cows and made milk. Because uh -huh. the feed business was pretty good business during the war. Uh -huh. And then everything went 
Yeah. Skybus. And of course, she couldn't buy a truck. Right. And come to the point that we needed a new truck to keep going. And the farmer up Drybrook who drew milk out of Drybrook to the creamery where you live. Yeah. Um, had a brand new truck. And so in order to get a new truck, Harold bought milk out in the truck. <laughs> and oh then goodness. he trucked milk for 20 years. Wow. Out of Bright Road, oh besides no. running a truck, another truck on the road. Oh no. So oh I don't know what we were. We just went from one thing to another. Yeah. And um, so did you always, you didn't live here at that time. Why did you mm -hmm. move? You did move here at the time. Oh, we okay. lived here all the time. From the time Harold and I were married, we lived here with his parents. Uh-huh. And where were you? Where were your parents? Up here. My father worked for Google for years and years, George Google. Oh. I was born and brought up on the Google State. Oh, wow. Where King lives now. Uh -huh. That was his grandfather. Uh -huh. We went, we had a farm in Drybrook, not the last farm in Drybrook, pretty nearly. Um, we had, we had a dairy of cows ourselves. And at that time, we didn't have a creamery. My, my parents made butter. Oh, no. And um, in 19, I was 11 when we went to the Golden State to live on the estate in 1913. So they were caretakers then? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. And he, he worked for George Gould all his life as a young man, my father, because oh. they employed quite a few people. Uh -huh. In the summertime, my father had about 80 or 85 men on the payroll. My goodness. The George School ran a big business. Of course, at the time, the Janice, when my father was there, there was no no cars or anything. We every morning, one of the one of the teamsters come to the train and sent milk. Met the train in, in here in Arkville at say nine o'clock or ten o'clock whenever the train went to New York. Yeah. It was Elston, Delaware. Uh -huh. They brought eggs and milk and butter. Uh -huh. Every day they were sent. And of course they had an estate in Lakewood and it was sent to the city, New York City, and it was sent to Lakewood and it was sent to Rye. Every morning they brought milk and eggs and butter and put it on the train. Mm -hmm. And of course they had three they had three teams of horses, and then on the way back, they would take feed back to the farm. Oh, that's pretty efficient. And it was every day for a long, long, long period to war come, until the war, the first of World War I. Wow. And they had their polo ponies there, and they had their dogs there from South Carolina. Uh -huh. Oh, they run a big place. And we, they had a dairy of Jersey cows, and they had three teams of horses all all year round. Plus, they had single horses too. And then in the summertime, they had their polo ponies there. The polo ponies come out from Lakewood and was there all summer. And the dogs were there in the summertime, and they went to North Carolina to High Point in the fall and come in the spring. Nine year hundred dogs. My goodness, for what? Oh, <laughs> They had oh, hunting dogs. Yeah. And of course they had their hunting dogs that they used in the wintertime in North Carolina, but it was too hot for them there in the summer. They brought them up here. But it was cool. Well, it is unbelievable when you think of it now. I was at the, um, you, I, don't, I don't know whether you were over at the center then or not, when they had the musical recital in the church, Mr. Gould sponsored that, the Ar Roxbury Art Group. It was in September, I think. Oh, I, I didn't see or it. Or October, it was, no, it was about September. Uh -huh. Well, I went with my niece, who was up here on the top of the hill. She was in the Rochester Music, University of Rochester Music Department. And that she wanted to go, and we went. I went with her, and that's the first time I'd been back on the estate in a long, long time. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh, I did hear about that. Mm -hmm. He's, uh, they have that once or twice a year, and they, they sponsor that once or twice a year. I think it's once a year, I mm -hmm. So tell me about quilting. When did you start quilting? Oh, uh, Janet's quite a story. I was about nine 
And there's, I can remember, I went down to see my Aunt Jane Fairman, which was my mother's aunt. Uh -huh. And she was an old lady, a dear old lady, and she had a quilt on. Of course, I'm a family of six, the third one down. Uh -huh. And I always used to like to sew for my dolls. And I'd go down to Aunt Jane, and she'd give me her patch box, and I could take all her laces and all this uh -huh. and all that and make clothes for my dolls. And I used to do that twice or three times during the winter because the snow was this deep. You know? Yeah. Uh -huh. And Aunt Jane had a quilt on, and if I remember correctly, it was a fly heat, which is a quilt I like. Yeah. And I, I said to Aunt Jane, will you show me how to quilt? She says, yes, Deanie, I will, which they always call me Deanie. Uh -huh. She says, yes, Jeannie, I will, but you know, you can't quilt unless you put your finger going down and coming up. <laughs> and I thought, well, I don't know if I want it or not. But anyway, Aunt Jane showed me how to quilt, and then I'd make quilts for my dolls. But my mother, uh, my mother had too much to do to quilt then and yeah. take care of six kids and like that, and make butter and so on and so forth. Uh -huh. And. Uh, in the wintertime, Mother made what we called tacks, you know, the back and the, the bottom, uh, the back and the front would be the same, and they tie them. Oh, okay. Just all one color. Okay. Sew calico together oh, and okay. make a quilt, and that's what my mother made quilts for the family that way. Sometimes she pieced a quilt, but rarely, yeah. at, at that time. And then, of course, after my mother got so that she didn't have so much to do, she quilts, but I never participated. I had something else to do. Yeah. And I, I, well, I was only three years of high school. I went to New York to work in Mike Pop Mine. Oh, did you really? I worked five years there. Wow. And um, what, how did you go about, why did you, did you want to leave? Or? Well, I wanted to work. I was thinking about 18. Uh-huh. <coughs> In the third year of high, and my sister went. My sister went to Merchant and Bankers. My older sister, older than me, went to Merchant and Bankers Business School in New York, uh -huh. and she got a job in the Metropolitan. So I said, Irene, I said, if you can get a job, I can get a job. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I went down and applied for a job, and I was there five years. Where did you live? Uh, sometimes I lived on 29th Street. Sometimes on 73rd. Uh -huh. I lived between, on 29th Street, we went, they called it the Anthony Home. You had to be recommended there through your church. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And it was the self-supporting women in New York City. It was built by the Vanderbilt. Oh. They call it the Anthony Residence now, and I think the um, Salvation Army has it. Wow. And um, they had two girls to a room, and my sister was there. Uh -huh. And uh, so I, I got a room there, and we roomed together. And then in the summertime, I was on 73rd. In the wintertime, I was on 73rd, and in the summertime, I was on 29th. Because I lived with the Durants, living on 73rd between 30 and Lexington. And he was Mr. Jason's chauffeur. Oh. And he had, they had an apartment over the garage on 73rd Street. And they, had, they took me in. <laughs> long, long lost child. And uh, I would stay with Lady Fred and Leon during the winter months uh -huh. when they were up here summering. Uh -huh. She was in a cottage up here, Lady Friend, and they have a daughter. And um, I would stay with Lady Friend. We, they're French, and we always called her Lady Friend. Yeah. yeah. And uh, live with them. Wow. I went up to Ottawa in Canada when we opened our head office in Ottawa for six months. Very and that's the only time I saved any money because they give us living expenses up there, Janet. Oh, really? <laughs> you no, know, they set up, uh, I think we, I don't know, on one of the floors in the Met, we set up a Canadian office, you know, as it would be up in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we went up and taught the Ottawans our wow. lingo. Mm -hmm. so, what was your job? I was a typist, and then I was a checker. I was, I was, I was responsible when I came home for five typists. And what, so what did you do in New York? 
Oh, well, I went after I got so which I knew was east, west, north, and south, I had a glorious time. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> oh, I've seen all of New York, you can see. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, when my, my sister got married, and the roommate I had was a dear little girl, I often wonder what happened to Justine. She was a, a girl more or less by herself, alone. Mm -hmm. She had a father, but... Well, she, uh, she, uh, Justine was a great deal older than me, yeah. by five or six years, and we w went around New York all together, all to see everything we could see for nothing, and what, yeah. we, and what we had money to pay for, we paid for. I, I have to tell you this, Janet, the circus came into New York, Barnum and Bailey's, uh -huh. I said, of course, I heard the girls talking in the office. Oh, it was fun to go watch the circus. Uh, <laughs> get off the train, you know, and box car and so on and so forth. So it was Saturday afternoon. I said, Justine, I said, let's go over to the circus station and watch them debark. She says, okay. So we went over and we was looking. I think it was between six and seven, I don't know. And no, an old male elephant had to tinkle. Yeah. Oh, Justine, I, I never saw such a, such a, such a thing in my life. I said, come on, Justine, there's no place for us, let's go. <laughs> I said, like, they, they dug a hose in the ditch, you know, and all this water was coming out of it. <laughs> I said to Justine, let's get out of here. <laughs> so we went down the next block and walked home. <laughs> And we would ride a Fifth Avenue bus. We'd take the Staten Island ferry just uh -huh. to pass away time, you know? Uh-huh. Uh, <coughs> we didn't work on Saturday afternoon. We was out at 12 o'clock. Uh -huh. We worked from 9 to 4.30 during the week and 12 o'clock Saturday. Uh-huh. But, oh, I had a glorious time when I was in the work. So what made you come back? Well, I came back on vacation. I'm on the leave of absence. Still? From Metropolitan Life? Metropolitan Life. Everybody I can go out. We have a boy in the head of Brad Brook who married a girl from Phyllis Armstrong from the head of Brad Brook, uh -huh. who's president of the Metropolitan Life. Uh -huh. uh, Donald Rizal. Uh -huh. And uh, I guess he thought I was lying to him. I was talking to him to my granddaughter's graduation party. Which is, uh, she's a baker, and uh, their relatives of the Armstrongs and bakers. Uh -huh. uh, her husband is, and Donald was there for Lenora's graduation party. And he said to me, Come over, he said, Eldeen, I said, I hear you work for the Metropolitan Life. I said, Yes, I did. I still am on a leaf of absence. I said, You want me back? <laughs> because he went and got all my records. Oh, he did? <laughs> and of course, the microphone, you know. Uh -huh. But he sent them to me. He said, I sent you these just for a bit of fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, but, you did know, of course, then, of course, as I say, Harold and I was married in 28, mm -hmm. and we didn't make any money to have any money ahead of us until 1933 or 4. Uh -huh. And we had planned to build a stone house up on top of the hill. And father and mother Garrison were getting old. They didn't want us to build a house. They wanted us to put our money in this house. We yeah. lived here. So, and they lived with us. So that's what we did. Because uh -huh. they went to Florida every winter. They had a little home down in Sessa Hills in Florida, Harold's parents. Uh -huh. What we would call a camp up here, they called a home in Florida. Right. <laughs> Pigs run the chickens run into the house without, you know, if I'm still. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. No, it was, uh, oh, it was just a little cottage, really. Mm -hmm. But they went every winter. They was warm and comfortable, yeah. and, and they didn't need much entertainment. <laughs> they were too old for entertainment. Of course, Mother Garrison was a great church book, but she went to church every Sunday. That's about our own participation was in the church mm -hmm. doing. And uh, Carol's mother died in 31, but 
cancer, and Grandpa looked it up all that time, so he died in 50. Yeah, he lived with us about 20 years now. But he was a grand old man. My kids loved him and he loved the children. Mm -hmm. the, he went to Florida every year because he was 84 mm -hmm. every winter, but he said he was getting too old to go by himself. So then he stayed home. Oh, I said, oh. Mm -hmm. And of course, our daughter. Our oldest daughter went to Cupid College, and we didn't have we didn't have college money, Janice. We just worked and earned it. Yeah. Okay. And of course, as I say, as I say, Nat went to college. Some weeks she got seventy five cents to spend. Some weeks she didn't have nothing to spend, but she was happy. Mm -hmm. She's an RN. She works in in Canandaigua, in the hospital in Canandaigua now. One of us. Not this hospital, but the old hospital. That's a new hospital. The old hospital, the Cuca girls did a lot of training in Canada, out of Cuca. They worked in the Genesee Valley Association of Nurses. Mm -hmm. uh, the first year in college, she was there the complete year. And then after that, they were out wherever. There was 18 girls in the class who was studying for RN. And they sent them out in groups of nine, uh -huh. and wherever these nine could work in the hospital, they they went, and then they they worked the whatever session they would call it, and then they go back to college for a while, and then they go uh -huh. sent someplace else. Uh -huh. She did. She worked in nine hospitals uh -huh. when she was going to school, and she got married in '51. She married a boy, graduated from Annapolis. In '49, uh -huh. and of course Wood stayed in the Navy, and wherever he went, she went. And when she went to California, she had to try the California State Board because they won't oh, they yeah. won't recognize New York State. Right. I guess there's only two states in the union won't recognize the New York State license. That's Massachusetts and California. Yeah, that's probably because they're competing with them or something. I don't know, because she nursed in Florida, she nursed in Virginia. And she nursed in California. Mm -hmm. And after the children came, she didn't do no nursing. She kept up her life at so. And then when she, they went to Cal uh, they went to Japan for three and a half years. Wow. And uh, Hal, the youngest one, was born in Japan. Wow. Well, we call him my little Jap. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't like it very much. <laughs> he went down to Annapolis last about two or four weeks ago with his father to look the Annapolis over. He thinks he kind of likes it over Annapolis. Oh. But they have four children, two boys and a girl. Mm -hmm. And Billy, that's the second one. He's um, head of the sanitation department in the city of Canada. Oh. He graduated from Cortland. He's a science, uh, science, science major. Right. Uh -huh. And his wife teaches school in Canada. Uh -huh. She's a science teacher. She has sixth, seventh, and eighth grade science in Canada for school. Mm -hmm. So my brother and uh, Diane has a master's from Cornell. Wow. Uh, her. She didn't go to Cornell. Her father is a teacher in Cornell, and uh, but she could go to Cornell tuition free. Oh, that's yeah. But she only went to the year and got her master's. Mm -hmm. She was going to study micro biology, microbiology, but she said it was too difficult. Like <laughs> <laughs> just saying the word is difficult. Yeah, <laughs> but she's a very sweet girl. Mm -hmm. So let me up that quote again. Did you, since this is what I'm supposed to be writing about, though, your story, though, was wonderful. Um, what was I saying? No, after I come, I started to tell you, after I come back to New York, right, that's where got married. Okay. Of course, I went to church and joined the Ladies' Aid, as they called it then, yeah. which is the ladies' group, okay. and they were quilting. Okay. Of course, I, I always enjoyed sewing. 
and I just got involved in closing more or less again through the Women's Society of the Arco Methodist Church. Uh -huh. And then, of course, the church went, and I still was making quotes, just for myself, more or less. Mm -hmm. And when Delaware Opportunities came to the Margaretville section, one of the girls ahead of uh, had the shop in Margaretville, she called me on the phone one day, she says, Emma Dean, she says, won't you let me have one of your beautiful clothes? I said, well, surely. I don't know if I can or not. I said, and I don't know if I want to sell them or not. Yeah. But she said, let me have it, will you? And she says, oh, well, I said, I don't know if I, if I put it in a window, it'll, everybody thinks it's for sale anyway. So I said, well, I don't know, surely, whether I'm eligible to sell to Delaware Opportunities or not. Well, she says, I'll come up and talk to you. I said, okay. So she came up. And she says, is all I have to ask you is your Social Security. What you have make in Social Security? Well, I said, it's very darn much. I'll tell you yeah. that. <laughs> because I was drawing on my own. I wasn't drawing on Harold's Social Security. Oh. I was drawing on my own. Right, right. Which was, at the time, it was a little under $100 after they took out my Medicare, right, you know? Right, right. And she says, I don't have to ask you how much money I got, you got in the bank. Well, I really I got this in any paper. <laughs> <laughs> and so she took my quilt and she called me the next day. She said, oh, Dean, you know something? I said, no. She says, your quilt was sold. So, wow. So when was I hung it up? Wow. And I had two or three made at that time. And she took them all, and it was all sold to Delaware Opportunity Seekers. And that's just the way I got in quilting. Oh, wow. Uh, that is, you know, quilting, say, to make a quilt and sell it. That's just the way I got into it. So right. Delaware Opportunity. Right. So it wasn't, is it hard to sell them after putting all that work into them? Or do you well, I think it's getting now because of the, a lot of competition. Yeah. And people are getting conscious of work, color, design, and everything. And of course, Nancy, Nancy started the quilt club, and we were down. And I called her on the phone, and I went to see Nancy. And I says, Nancy, can't we start a club? And she says, That's what I'd like to do. So I joined. I didn't join. I mean, she didn't have a club going then. She just had it kind of in the air, you know. Yeah. So she says, come and help us quilt, Evelyn. And I says, well, if I have a chance, I will, Nancy. But, you know, I says, I don't drive. And um, my neighbor across the street, she was then, she was a friend of Nancy, and she went down to quilt, so she took me. Uh -huh. And uh, then we thought we'd start a club, and it was started down in Nancy's husband's gun shop. Oh, I see. Our club that's over there now, we just went from one to another, uh -huh. inviting a, a, a what was a fairly good quilter yeah. to join the club. Uh -huh. And that's why, and I tried for a long time to get them to come over here to the Earth Center. Yeah. I said, that's what Mr. Earth, at that time, Mr. Earth was living. I said, that's what Mr. Earth wants, is this, this kind of work. And that's, right. what it, that's what the center was bought for, was right. for people to use the natives to use, have a good time in it, and have a quilt show and so on and so right. forth. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, I said they got a very lovely administrator. The administrator who was before John. Or he wasn't, Yeah, he wasn't very cooperative. Oh, he wasn't? Uh, well, of course, I don't know. That's what they say. I don't know the man at all. Yeah. But I said, I talked to John, Mr. Hopkins, and I said, this is what John would like. So they called me one day on the phone. They said, Abedin, can we come to your house? Uh, and I said, no. I said, I can't have the quilt club here every week. I said, I have no place to put the quilts. Yeah, I can't is. have it. No, that isn't what we want. We want to meet at your house and go over and talk to oh. Mr. Hopkins. And I said, well, okay. <coughs> Sure, you're welcome to do that, but I said, as far as me taking the quilt club in my, in my home, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> There's too much to be considered. Mm -hmm. 
And that's the way it started over there. We come and talk. So. Well, that's just the way I started in the quilt business. Just mm -hmm. really two Delaware opportunities, at least I think, <laughs> at selling quilts. And of course, the first year that we had a quilt show, I didn't have a quilt for show, but to sell. Yeah. But through the show, I sold five, I got orders for five quilts. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. And that's just kept going and going and going. After I got them done, somebody else. Mm -hmm. But you <laughs> own a lot of quilts too, right? Oh, I, I've got, I've made each one of the grandchildren uh -huh. a quilt. Uh -huh. And they, they don't get it before they're married. Oh. So I've got, I got Lenore's, I got Jimmy's, and I got Hal's. Uh -huh. And I've got Lyle's upstairs uh -huh. in the dresser. And Lyle's is a dressing plate of green, made shades of green. And Lenore's is, um, well, it's a copy. On our 50th wedding anniversary, our grandson was in the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. And he sent home a, a card to us on our 50th anniversary. And along the edge of the card was quilt box. Oh. And my granddaughter Cheryl said, Nana, can't you pass me these quilt box and make a quilt for me? Oh. I says, I guess it could be done, my, uh, Cheryl. So I went to work and studied out the blocks and made my blocks and made her a quilt and gave it to her at her wedding. Uh -huh. And uh, then I made Lenore one, uh -huh. which is Betty's girl that's not married yet, uh -huh. daughter is not married yet. And uh, I have that upstairs, mm -hmm. and I have Jimmy's, which is shades of brown, and I made one like it for John and Meg, and um, the one copy from my Christmas wedding anniversary, I made three of those and sold. Oh, uh -huh. And I sold them from the one that I had on exhibition over at uh, the Earth Center. Oh, uh -huh. And I made my little great-great-grandsons a little farmer boy quilt uh -huh. for a single bed, each one of them. Uh -huh. And um, I made black hands, yellow hands, white hands, and brown hands oh. for international. Oh. I showed no discrimination. <laughs> <laughs> and them That's out. really nice. And I had that on exhibition over at Earth Center the following year, the second year we had a show. And there was a lady from Bel Air Village. She came out to Francine, and Francine Leidenheim was, yeah. I don't know, secretary or something over yeah, there. I don't know what they call them anyway. Yeah. She, and she came out to Francine, and she says, I want this quilt. She says, that quilt's not for sale. You cannot have that quilt. She says, I'm going to take it. Francine says, no, you can't take it. It's not for sale. And of course, they had a conversation. She says, I think the girl who made it would make you one. So. I made one for this lady in Bel Air Village. I couldn't tell you her name now, so uh -huh. don't go. Uh -huh. And that's just the way it went. But I never put one out for sale in, the, right, in our quilt show. Uh -huh. And last year, I don't think I only had two over there. One of those is, was um, the it old, old quilt. The, um, um, the old, old, well, I think it's but some call it light and day, some calls it dark and shadows, but I call it the pineapple quilt. And I had 19 of those blocks given to me by a girl I played cards with in the club. Mm -hmm. And she says, Everdeen, Florence says, Everdeen, I don't know who would enjoy these more than you would. She says, I haven't anybody in the family I, that wants it. Of course, she only had one son, and his wife didn't want the blocks. Mm -hmm. So she brought the blocks to me, mm -hmm. and I made the 20th block and put the quilt together. Mm -hmm. And everybody likes me to show that quilt because it is quite pretty. It is, I, yeah, that's the one that you had to figure out the pattern and you had to find fabric that yeah. was like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I dug in grandma's patches and everybody's patches to get me. Was it hard to figure out the pattern? No, it isn't hard to figure out the pattern. Mm -hmm. There's just your shadings, your light and your dark. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nina knew the lady who made it. Oh, she did? Uh, Mrs. Beardsley. Mm -hmm. And Nina and I sat down and figured out that those blocks are about 125 years old. Mm -hmm. 
Now, how'd you figure that out? Well, this lady worked for Nina after, oh, Nina had her children, and she, of course, Nina worked in the barn all the time. Right. And uh, Mrs. Beardsley worked for Nina, and I knew about when she made it. Mm -hmm. She made it before she was married. Oh. The okay. lock she made as a girl. You know, a girl coming up, as Mrs. Grassley did. So oh. we figured out from there that, that those blocks were about 125 years old. And, and you can't tell. No. Which is your block. And, um, well, I don't know. I can tell because this one particular color that's in it, I knew it was yeah. Nat's dress in school. <laughs> I got into it, and of course, I love to sew, mm -hmm. but now I can't see. That's the worst trouble. Oh, really? I had the left eye operated on as, as an okay. implant. Yeah, as an implant, the left eye, and the right eye is very bad, and I think, I think now that the eyes are not equal, you know, to see with, okay. I think that's what bothers me, because yeah. I can put my hand over this eye and I can see very, very plain of my left eye to the road and everything. Oh. But I think it's just that the eyes are not balanced. Right. It may be, I may be wrong. I have to go back to the ophthalmologist December 30th. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm not going to have it done this fall or this, this time of year because Kingston is a long ways away. Yeah. And I only have Betty to drive me and my daughter Betty. And if it's icy and snowing, you can't go because she won't drive on the ice. I mean, right. which nobody likes to, but yeah. she doesn't want it. But, well, once you, once you have the operation, then you're always at home. The right? well, Williamson well, has them. Had both of the mm -hmm. no problem. Well, I hope I hope I don't have no problem. I can see pretty good with my left eye the thread the needle, but I have an awful job to thread the needle. Yeah. And my coordination, of course, Janice, I may be coordinated. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I sure can. Things things. So, do you quilt every day, pretty much? No. no. I only quilt when I, I make blocks, practically. If I'm making a quilt, I tell you what I do. If, I, if I've got a quilt on, I can, on the frames. I can't sit down and quilt only about an hour to a time. Okay. Then I'm tired. Uh -huh. Well, what else am I going to do? So I have a quilt that's going, I pick up the blocks, and maybe I'll sit down and make a block or two, maybe when the neighbor will come in, we'll play four or five games of pinochle or whatever. <laughs> <else. laughs> and that's, I just, I just don't work. I just cannot work over an hour to a time. Yeah. My back gets tired, and my eyes get tired, oh. I get tired, and I think, oh dear, this is foolish sitting here doing this. Uh. Get up. You'll find Christmas all over the house now. Uh. And that's just the way I work. What's your favorite part of the whole process? I don't like to piece. No. I like to applique, but I do not like piecing, and I don't make many piece quilts, uh -huh. but I applique. I don't know. I got artists with three quilts this winter. Yeah. And I don't know whether I'm going to get them done or not. They take a little more time. I, uh, I, the community fair here in Africa, which has, operates once a year, you know, they have a fair once a year. They have a group that works all winter. And they come to me to make a quilt. Yeah. And I said, well, I'll make you a top, but I won't quilt it. Right. And, and I said, no, I won't quilt it for you, but I'll make you a top. And they're supposed to bring me the foundation, but they haven't brought it yet. And I have another order to make. I'll show you what that is. That's from, I sold this lady, Mr. and Mrs. Ray from Roxbury Run. I sold them two quilts, but they, uh, they brought the, they ordered them. I right. mean, and they were ordered, really, the one through the exhibit that I had it. The nerve center. The other one was not. Mm -hmm. And Mrs. Ray, she was here this fall, 
They brought that quilt up from New York. The basket quilt was over there. It belonged to them. I made it, but it wasn't my quilt because I had sold it. Uh -huh. Everybody said, that'll be in your quilt. I said, no, it's not my quilt. I said, I made it, but I sold yeah. it. So it's not my quilt. Uh -huh. And uh, they come up to pick up that quilt, and they said, if you make a quilt this winter, and don't want it for the children, she said, I'd like the first chance to buy it. So I said, well, I'm going to make one, and I showed her what it was. So I'll go upstairs and get it and show oh, you okay. the picture. Great. In the meantime, have a piece of fudge. Sure. Mm. I'll get some left. Oh, oh. I got these down at the buttonhole. Where's that? The sogety. And I gotta put my shape. This is gonna be the border. These two will be the border. Mm -hmm. and then these is what I'm gonna put together with the other block. These colors here. And I gotta work them in. I gotta pick them out. I haven't. I haven't sat down and decided which is gonna go where. Yeah. Yeah. Because Christmas, you can't do much till after Christmas. I can't. Right. So. But listen, that was thirty-eight fifty right there. You're kidding. No. Wow. Thirty-eight fifty, and the time you get a quilt, the top all together, and the chair and the bar part, you got a hundred dollars in it. So when you say you want three hundred and fifty dollars for a quilt, yeah, you got a hundred dollars worth of material. Yeah, and then time on top of it. Yeah, right. and your time. So and of course, people think, people think, because you do it, you ought to sell it for nothing. You know what I mean? It's just your time. Yeah. But. I don't figure that way. I, I don't either. So how long does it take you to uh, do a quilt? Oh, it'll take me, it will take me, it takes longer to quilt it than it does to make it. It does me, I mean. Uh -huh. right. And of course, when you sell a quilt, you quilt it by yourself, more or less. And um, so, of course, as I say, I don't know. I have the slightest idea and of course, I tell you what, uh, one of the most important parts of quilting is your cutting. Mm -hmm. I think it's your cutting, your exact cutting. Yeah. But it's, that's the part you don't like. No, I don't like to cut. Yeah. And yeah. I don't like to piece. But I got to do both. I got to do right. both if I do one. Right. But. Now, this is uh, Eleanor Faulkner over there. Yeah. She's a beautiful sewer yeah. and a beautiful color. Mm -hmm. And she does a lot on the machine, too. Oh, does she? I can't do machine sewing. I can't sew a straight seam on the machine. Oh, really? Huh? You know? And I tell you, another beautiful craft worker is Joanne Kittle. Joanne's beautiful craft worker. Which one's Joanne? Do I, did, she's not over here, is she? Yeah, she comes to the quilt club on Monday. The blonde one? The blonde one. She's right. a hairdresser. Right, okay. She goes to Kingston on a Friday and Saturday to work in Kingston on a shop in Kingston. Oh, I didn't know that. She lives over on the Noble. Oh, I didn't know that. And she, her, her husband is a cousin to Nina. Or Nina's an aunt to her husband. Oh, wow. Hmm. So when were you inducted into the Hall of Fame? It was the first year. I don't know when it started. When did John leave? 1982. Well, John was there. I think it was 70. Was it? Was it 80 or 79? Oh, you were the first. They must have been. I, I was the first one. We were the. Must have been 80. I don't know. I just can't tell you when it was. Uh -oh. Yeah, I don't know. Um, do you know who nominated you? No, I do not know. Because Nina, I went in one morning and she says, well, she says, you know, do you mean now we're elected to the Hall of Fame? I said, what in the world are you talking about, Nina? Yeah. But she said, didn't you didn't you know? even know you were nominated? No, she said, didn't you know you were elected in the Hall of Fame? <laughs> I says, no. She says, I wonder why we were. I said, we're so damned old. They didn't want else to do with us. <laughs> that is funny. And so I, I, no, I, I. They didn't even tell you. No, Janet. I, and uh, 
last year, last year I don't remember Nancy even saying we could suggest somebody to the Hall of Fame because we submit a name to the board of directors, the Hall of Fame. They're the one that chooses the one that has elected the Hall of Fame, the board of directors of the Hall right. of Fame. But I don't know the first thing about it. Right. I don't know even how it was started or anything. Mm -hmm. I think it was... I don't know whether John started it or... I think it was Nancy, actually. Or whether it was his suggestion or what. Could it have been? I don't know. I don't know. I really don't know myself. No. So you didn't have an induction ceremony or anything? Oh, we had an induction ceremony after we was elected for well, all the fame. Okay. But we, I knew nothing was going on, not one thing. Uh -huh. Uh, and then the guy said to Nana, and Nana said, how do you suppose we were elected? I said, because we should have nothing else to do with it. <laughs> Has nothing to do with your talent? Uh -huh. Well, that's the part that I can't understand. Why? Because you see, now, in our club, it seems to be age. Because Nana and I was first. Mm -hmm. Then it was Elsa Sampson. Mm -hmm. And last year it was all not Falcon. And I don't know whether it's age, an age or what it is, but when it comes to color, I said to the girls one day, I said, you're all off. That color is not right. Yeah. And uh, so I don't know. I have the slightest idea how it was chosen, whether it's because something you might know about quilting or something that you have done about quilting or what. I don't know what it is. I, 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 Janice, I really don't know. I'm as innocent as anybody <laughs> can be. It's like this, like this job I got into in the senior citizen's club. Right. <laughs> Secretary. Oh dear, I don't know what I'm trying to do to more than a man's move. Right. It's because you're good at things. Oh, well, People trust you. Well, I said I'm not so dumb, but what? Maybe I can learn, but I forget all Yeah. Uh, now, do you think that quilting is an art? Oh, it's an art in itself, very much so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know what kind of art they call it. But, uh, Janice, you know where I think there's an awful lot of... I don't know whether it's ingenuity or whether it's a mother of invention or what. Mm -hmm. uh, those quilts that come from the Amish country, the, the color is all dark. Now, I myself, as much as... I think I like color and kind of understand the blend of color. I can't see putting purple and red together, which they do. Mm -hmm. But it's all heavy, heavy fabric. Mm -hmm. It isn't a percale or a calico, or what you might ever call it. It's, <clears throat> it's more or less to the woolen type of material. Their quilts are. Yeah. But they're absolutely gorgeous. Oh, you, even though the colors, they put together odd colors? Oh, they, well, they put a very difficult colors to me together to work with. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, is it because I like bright colors and don't appreciate the dark colors or what? I don't know. Uh -huh. But they are absolutely beautiful. Uh, we was to that <coughs> meeting up at Roxbury, the arts group had, and there was Mary Ann Marie Tucker from the Hay Barn. Uh -huh. she, she is Swiss, I think, because she'd been down in the Amish country. And, and she talk, talked about the Amish quilts and colors, which to me was, oh, it was a fascinating story. And she told it in such a sweet, sweet way that you just, mm -hmm. you just followed through with her, you know? Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> she said the Amish religion started in Switzerland, which I didn't. I had no idea where it started. But I, I think she is a Swiss extraction. Yeah. You know, she knows her colors, too. Yeah. She says, you do too, Ebony. And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm not like you. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Do you do any kind of um, original forms? Like I've noticed some of the women in the Catskill Mountain Quilters Guild are, you know, they do things that aren't patterns. They seem well, to be... Well, 
I don't know to tell you what I do. I just do it because I like it that way. Yeah, right. You know? uh -huh. And of course, I don't have patterns very much. Now that basket quilt I made had seven different baskets in it. Yeah, that was beautiful. I'm, I made all those baskets myself. Yeah. I don't design the pattern at all. Yeah. As Marjorie Slade would tell you, it's original. I don't think so. Uh, <coughs> you and Nina are the same. You don't. You can't brag about yourself. <laughs> Is this thing on yet? Oh, I, 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 I'd love to tell you something, but I don't. I'll turn it off. Oh, this was fun. And that's when they done some work in furlough up there. They. Uh -huh. They rebuilt the living room all over. And uh -huh. of course, there was no place for the men. They all came up from New York. It was all New York City men. They weren't local men. And they stayed in our house. Well, mother, my mother had to have help. And of course, Nina worked for mother. She worked two winters up at my mother's house. And, uh, and then she what and she do? just housework, you okay. know, help mother. She made bread one day. And <laughs> The old man, he was a, he was a carpenter, or an old man, probably between 60 and 70, at least that's the way he appeared to be, Janice, yes. I don't know how old he might have been. He um, Nana made the bread that day, of course, at those days, you know, you didn't have no transportation to the village to get bread, you made your own. Yeah, right. And they, they made bread, and, and um, Nana made the bread that day. And the old man says, his name was Lightfoot. <laughs> It was a peculiar name. Yeah. But he says, you know, I'd marry that girl who made that bread. And I says, but God, you wouldn't. Wow. <laughs> 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 oh, oh, she's a, she's very colorful. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. you two have known each other almost all your oh, yeah. life? Yeah. No, we haven't known none of them all our lives. No, I didn't know Nina until Nina come to work for my mother. Oh. Of course, her husband. Pete, uh, we, which we always call Pete, his name was Orson. Um, his cousin, there's my cousin, there's an oh. own cousin. Oh, I see. Um, um, brothers and sisters, children we are. And of course oh. we always called him Pete. And he was in our house coming up as a boy as much as he was in his own. And my brother Reg was the same way. He was in Pete's house down with Aunt Lizy, as we called her. Her name was Eliza, but we always called her Aunt Lizy. Mm -hmm. Aunt Lizy, she was as much with Greg was much at their house as Pete was at ours. And always as a family coming up, we'd have Christmas in our house one year and Aunt Lizy would have it the next. Mm -hmm. And we always had our Christmas back and forth mm -hmm. that year. Mm -hmm. That way. So it was very we were all close closely brought up together. Yeah. But <coughs> of course my name originally is Todd. And you can't find a tad that isn't related to a tad or a fair yeah. isn't related to a fair shirt, oh, shirt tail relation. Shirt tail relation somehow. <laughs> so the Stratton Todd at the bank is related to you? Mm-hmm. And you're all related to Mike Todd? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, now, of course, we're related. You can't say we aren't related, but it's very distant because it's a different family, mm -hmm. a different one of the family, you know? Yeah, right. A bank of the family, but you can't say we're not related. Mm -hmm. We are, of course, we're all descendants of old Sam Todd, the Revolutionary War soldier. Oh, oh yeah. Who was he? Sam Todd. Oh, he's he was he was quite a character. He was quite colorful mm -hmm. in his day, mm -hmm. and that we're all descendants of him. The whole mess of it. He had he had how many children? Well, I don't know. He had nine or ten kids. Um, and uh, he was married to um, Eliza Abel, mm -hmm. who was from Connecticut. Mm -hmm. She was a Dudley. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> his, she died when he was 67 or 79 or 81, somewhere in there. And he wanted to get married again, and he proposed to a lady to get married to her, uh, Rose, Jane Rosapants. Yeah. And this is funny. And she says, you got to give me time to think about it. 
give me time to think about it, whether I want to get married or not. He says, you better make your mind up pretty damn quick, because he says it's got another one in view. What? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Unbelievable. Did uh, she marry him? Yeah, she married him. <laughs> he was in his 80s, I think. Wow. He lived to be 101. Wow. His, his monument is, or his to stone is up in the Coldwell Cemetery. Oh. And he's Sam Todd, and as I say, we're all descendants of him. Right, right. And of course, my family is very close, because my grandfather was Reuben Todd, and Reuben Todd was the son of Sam, and that Sam was the son of Sam, and that's where we're the third generation back. Oh, my goodness. So it's a really old family. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He um, fought under Washington. He was at Valley Forge the winter that he was at Valley Forge. Wow. So how do you know all of this about him? Was oh. Kind of passed on? No, I got the. Uh, well, I have the genealogy, and of course a lot of it is handed down, uh, stories handed down. Mm -hmm. And my <coughs> nephew lives in Brooklyn, his son Eddie is very interested in genealogy. Mm -hmm. And he and I have been tracing the country around, finding this one and that one, both, oh, okay. both on the Todd side and the Thurman side. My mother was a Thurman, mm -hmm. and she was a family of 12. So many children. Yeah, and Grandma raised 10 of them. She only had two die in infancy. She raised 10 of them. My love, my mother lived to be 87. Wow. I see. I just don't know how you can have that many children and live to be. <laughs> I don't. I don't either, uh, uh, Janice. I, I really mean, it don't. It must be so exhausting. How can you? Oh, they didn't come away by baby's camp. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. I I really don't know. My mother had sick. I don't know. She brought us all up. But we live to tell the story. I left him for about nine I told you yesterday. Oh, you can. It'll be in the archive. You can listen to it. I was actually, I got lost for an hour. And then I had another appointment. So I only got to talk to her for like 45 minutes. So when she comes back, I'll talk to her again. As soon as I turned off the tape recorder, she had a million stories, of course. <laughs> yeah. But, I don't know, she told me about the farm and talked about the farm. But you can listen to it if you want, because we put everything in the archive and anyone can find it. I'm sure you know all the stories. You know. But, um, I can never remember my question, ever. <laughs> so good. What is it about quilting? I know you love to sew. What is it about quilting that keeps you going? Well, it's so creative. Yeah. You can use your imagination. Even you have a pa pattern, you can uh -huh. sit down and use your imagination and go on with it. And there's always something very intriguing about it that, well, now I must look this up. And I must do this and I must do that. When you come to making a, mm -hmm. a design or a pattern or well, did they use it in those days? Did, how how old is that pattern, and so on and so forth? You mm -hmm. know, there's always there's always a story connected with a quilt. Oh, there is. I think there always is a story connected with a quilt, no matter whether it's your own in, invention uh -huh. and design or what. Uh -huh. I think to me it's very intriguing. And you take a piece of scrap. So many of us, which so many of us use as a piece of scrap and put it together and have something beautiful in the end. It's so re rewarding. Uh huh. Uh huh. That's to me, it's such a rewarding thing. Uh huh. And it's in the end, it's all your own creativity. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Although you use a pattern. Uh huh. It's your own creative business that right. makes the right. makes the thing tick. Mm -hmm. So when you say story, do you mean story literally, like, or it just, uh, visually it tells a story? It, it, visually it tells yeah. a story. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Somebody had a, 
a great idea or something else to put the thing together this way or right. the colors they use or so on and so forth. Uh -huh. <coughs> it's, a, it's a challenge to me uh -huh. and I kind of like challenges. Uh -huh. That was that old book, the, the 19 blocks that you had to manage definitely a challenge. No, well, it was a pain, pain. painstaking work. Uh -huh. I had one, a, a magazine come yesterday. I, I don't care much for a quilt on the wall. Uh, you don't think they belong there? I don't know. They guess they belong there, but I guess you got to get accustomed to anything. Well, now I guess, uh, who was it? Ruth Culver or Hilda Cleaver? Um, that so many artists are now starting to quilt. So that you know, I mean, I mean not the, I mean, quilt, I think quilters are artists. That's not the point. I mean, people who are painters and you know, yeah, things know. like that are starting to quilt now. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's kind of influencing, or or basically, probably people are starting to recognize it as an art. You know, well, I think that's I think that's a whole question that's coming up, uh -huh. Janice. That they're uh, quilting, they're uh, beginning to realize that quilting is an art. Right. Which <coughs> I said, have another piece of fudge if you like. Okay. <laughs> I gotta make some more. I gotta make this another batch. This is delicious. Um. So that maybe that's why it's uh, people start using them as well. I don't know, could maybe just change the function of it. Well, of course. Also, it must be hard to use something that is as beautiful as quilts are, or can be. Well, that, uh, I have, upstairs, I have two, well, they were really rope beds, <coughs> but we, I, we put a beam on them. Mm -hmm. We didn't use the rope. And I made quilts for them. And, but now Jimmy was down, that's my grandson, he was down last week with his dog, and his dog sleeps on his bed, and I'm, I'm not going to sit down and work mm -hmm. three months or four months for a dog to lay on something. <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't put them on. Mm -hmm. But it's a shame not to use them, too. Mm -hmm. Really, it's a shame not to use them. <laughs> but I said to Jimmy, I said, I don't know, I have no notion to make you wash that spread on that bed. <laughs> Well, he says, I will, Nana, I will. I said, yes, I know you will, Jimmy. <laughs> Tell Jimmy, Jimmy, I said, Jimmy, before you leave Sunday, please put some fireplace wood on the porch for me. So this morning, I said, I guess I'll build up the fireplace and then put by the fireplace when Janice comes. I think it'll be kind of nice. Mm -hmm. And I went out when he had wood all over the porch. <laughs> he threw it here and there and all over. That was a nice pile. And that's Jimmy, you know. Well, mm -hmm. I got wood on the porch. That's well, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I gotta make some more tomorrow. You make it for the holidays? I made some for Thanksgiving and I had a few left pieces left over. And, uh, so Nancy said the other day, she says, you know, your Christmas gifts got to be homemade. It's got to be made out of fabric. Well, I said, Nancy, I can tell you one thing. I got my Christmas gift made for exchange of gifts in the, in the quilt club, but I says it's not fabric, but it's homemade. It's handmade. Uh -oh. I, I um, made a candle, crocheted a candle, one of those uh -huh. big fat candles, and put it over a coffee can, and so the coffee cans will fudge. Oh. And last week, I thought last week was the day we had our last money. I thought it was our quilt club. So, of course, I made fudge last Sunday. Of course, it keeps. But when I had two, two candles, I sent to Rochester. When the kids went back, I sent two candles back to Rochester because mailing was awfully expensive. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, fudge is... And I says, for goodness sakes, don't open them and eat them up before you get to yeah. Rochester. <laughs> Right. And then I had those few pieces left over. And Jimmy is not, Jimmy come down to hunt, but he didn't hunt. He was so nasty, he just kind of locked around the house. And uh, I said, Jimmy, you gotta put some fudge in that, ca in that tin box in the living room if you want some. I said, although you're not very fond of sweets, are you? He said, but I like your fudge, Nana. <laughs> I don't know whether the fireplaces burn over in the Fairview or not. I guess the gas, aren't they? Yeah. I think some of them might even be uh, walled up. I think the one in my office is walled up. It's a shame. And it must have been good. Oh, it was a pretty place. Mm -hmm. Where is your office, Jen? Up on the second floor. Turn to the right, it's the last office on the right, not the one with the ghost in it. <laughs> I am afraid of that office. <laughs> when I'm there at night by myself, I just, I can scare myself so badly that I just run out the door and leave everything behind. <laughs> well, the office, Mother and Father Garrison, the last time my mother Garrison lived, of course, they. When Harold and I was married, Harold's mother went and Harold and I both lived in the Fairview. Of course, they, they were, uh, Harold's family was brought up in a boarding house. There were five of them, five kids. In a boarding house? In a boarding house in Pine Hill, a big Indian. They owned the boarding house? Yeah, they owned the boarding house, and that's what, how they made their money, is to, board, to the boarding house. And I said, no, Grandma. I didn't say, no, I said, no, Mother Garrison. I said, I'm perfectly willing to go live anywhere that Harold wants to live, but I do not want to bring a family of kids up in the boarding house. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking about that the other day, but that's, I mean, it's really unusual to, that, you know, to have a family, and, you know, have a farm, and then to need extra money and have to rent out rooms or not have to or choose to. It, it's really kind of unusual. It's kind of, I don't know if it's unique to this area, but it's the first Well, it is. It is quite new, unique to this area. Uh -huh. Now, of course, we only had 14 cows on our farm. Yeah. But if we didn't, hadn't raised our own food, like our garden and our potatoes and the cabbage and your winter crops that you can store that you don't have to jar up to right. keep. It, but after all, it's a very pleasant way of living, a very home way of living. It isn't this rough hustle and bustle yeah. here. I got five minutes here, I got five minutes there. Right, right. It, the world is moving too fast, I think, today, anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's too much going on. To I'm not a television watcher, but I had the, I had the news on this morning, and first thing I knew, Donahue was on the, I wasn't in the, by the television, Donahue was on, and he had a program that this boy, I think, this man, had been living with Rock Hudson, and they were talking about AIDS. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought to myself, Donahue, maybe your program is all right, but I said, I think it, 
I don't know. Because of the subject he was talking about? No, I I think I think it's good to bring it up to oh. the people. Oh. But I don't know how he, I don't know how they say the things they say so publicly. I know. <laughs> okay. Um, or something. I says, Daddy, I says, let's go up one of these roads. We come over the Great Smokies coming up from Florida. Mm -hmm. I says, let's go up one of these gullies and see what's up there. He says, well, chase us out. They think we're rum <laughs> I, I would love, I would love to go and say in Kentucky and Virginia up some, some of those ravines where the, these houses, well, the roads are there, and there's car tracks, so you know they aren't all horse and buggy day. Uh -huh. But I'd love to go up there and see some, visit with some of those mountain people. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would just love it. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I definitely. Well, I don't know. We came, as I say, we came over the Great Smokies, and coming off. I said to Harold, my gracious, I don't know how they make a living here. Those farms are just as steep. I said, there's one or two tobacco stocks and mm -hmm. a few corn stocks. I said, he can make his corn liquor and his tobacco. Right. <laughs> right. I said, I guess that's all they care about is that if they uh, have a room uh, enough to plant a few rows of corn right. and a few rows of tobacco, they got their tobacco uh, and their corn liquor. Right. But they're so poor. I know I saw one porch where there was a quilt hanging on. I said, I'd love to go look at that. It was so pretty. And where we where we were from the roadside, you know, looking out there, it was so pretty. Mm -hmm. And it was such a steep little house. It don't seem to me it was only one room wide and mm -hmm. <laughs> about four stories high. <laughs> but it wasn't that way. But that's the way it appeared. Yeah, right. It was looking out from where we were. Uh -huh. And the the lady, I suppose she was the lady of the house, she stood out there on the porch with her apron, apron string all the way down her back. Yeah. Starts to the high, he high heels, as they tell about. Starts to the high heels? Yeah. Oh. Does that mean that it's a long... <laughs> no, I'd love to go through the mountains of Virginia and back to some of those farm country homes, or country homes. Mountain homes, I guess you call them. So even though you had a wonderful time in Manhattan, you still had to be here? The reason I didn't go back, of course, it was a very peculiar thing. I worked for Harold's mother one summer in the boarding house in Big India. And always after 9 o'clock, well, between, say, 8, eight o'clock and after, when all the dishes was done, and everything was put away for morning. Even Father Garrison went with us. To me, at that time, he was an old man. Yeah. He was. But that's the way he appeared to me. We'd go down in the pine grove in Big Indian and have a barbecue, uh -huh. chickens or anything. And it wasn't just young folks. Uh -huh. It was old folks. Uh -huh. And that was their way of living. I had the most beautiful time. And as I say, there's always to be a girl and a boy, and but Never was Harold and I hooked up together, what I mean to say we went together or anything. But when I came home on my last vacation, of course Harold was living here at the time, and my home was 10 miles up. Uh -huh. He came up one afternoon and he said, would you like to go for a ride? I said, yeah, sure, I'd love to go for a ride. So I got in the car and away we went. I went in and told mother, I said, I'm going with Harold. I don't know where we're going now, but I said, I'm going with Harold. And, uh, that was it. So uh -huh. I got very interested, and I didn't want to go back to New York. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And that's the reason I didn't go back. Then I got a job home because it wasn't for two years. I worked in what well, is a department store now, but it wasn't connected to the other building. The other building, what, where they have all their uh, clothes, yeah. was. Um, Halperin's, it was a men's department store, a men's store, mm -hmm. more or less, Hot Sheriff and Marks, you know, mm -hmm. and it was Halpin Brothers, but then Harris bought the, the department store, well, it's what was sports store where I worked and clerked, uh -huh. and put the two together where the shoe store is and the department store now was an alleyway, oh, and they, they connected them together, the Harris did when he bought the sports store. Mm -hmm. I clerked there for two years. Uh -huh. 
I came home in 1926 when I was married in 28. Mm -hmm. I went to work in the Met in 1921. Mother Figgis Cuff, I went. The morning I applied for a job, there was probably 250 or so in the and applying for jobs. It was wow. 50 of us accepted. Wow. I was one of them. Wow. And of course, um, I got a mail hops job. <laughs> a mail hop? Yeah. <laughs> Carrying mail, you know, from uh -huh. one to the other. Uh -huh. And of course, there was five girls on the team. And um, I was the new one in. Uh -huh. and, um, it said if you approved after six weeks, you got a dollar increase in salary. I only got twelve dollars a week. Well, a dollar more meant a lot to uh, me. Yeah. Because I had to pay eight dollars for my room and board. Uh -huh. I only had four dollars left. That's all right if you're home, but I wasn't home. Right. So I explained to Mr. Bath. I I went up and I said I'd like to know why I didn't get an increase in salary because it says I, what do I do that's wrong? You know. I wanted to find out. He says, Miss Todd, you didn't do nothing was wrong. He says, we're transferring you today to the card section, which was on the same floor as I was. I was in the policy division. And he says, I don't want to lose you. He says, someday I'm going to get you back. But he says, in order to increase, to give you a dollar increase, which you are entitled to, he says, I've got to transfer you. He says, I can't give it to you and these other girls have been here two years and not increase their salary. Oh. So I was transferred with a dollar right. increase in salary, which was on the same floor. But then I was put on the file over in the card section. I was filed. Of course, we had, a, we had a division head and we had an assistant division head and we had a super division head mm -hmm. and in the policy division. And there was the policy section, the brief section, and the card section. Mm -hmm. I was I was transferred to the card section mm -hmm. and I was put on the files in the card section. And uh, I stayed on the files about six months and then I was transferred to the typewriter. Mm -hmm. I was a typist. Mm -hmm. and from a typist I went to a checker, mm -hmm. grade seven. I started at grade one and went to grade seven. And um, Mr. Strome, who was the floor walker, chucking out the policies to be in the school, he said, Miss Todd, go down there and straighten out those girls. I got those files all mixed up. I said, don't they know that two comes after one? He says, no, they don't. Uh, and oh, all the time I have to go down there and straighten up the files. But those girls could not file. They couldn't file one, two, three, four, five. Oh, my goodness. And, uh, and there were college girls, by golly. Two of them were college graduates. Mm -hmm. I said, what's the matter, you girls? Can't you count? Uh. <laughs> and, um, and then when they opened up the head office in Ottawa, um, they asked for volunteers. Of course, I volunteered to go. I thought it'd be fun. <laughs> <Why? laughs> I thought it'd be fun. And I bet it was. It was fun. Yeah. So everybody got sent home but me out of the division oh. and, uh, and the boss and he, his secretary proved to be one of the girls who went up with us and had quite a love affair going. Oh, really? And Mr. Dempsey, and that was the boss, he wanted me to stay. He wanted me to stay permanently. I said, no, I'm not going to stay permanently. Mm -hmm. and I said, I've been up here six months. I want to go home. Mm -hmm. Because the girl I was rooming with had to go home. I didn't have to. Yeah. It was still keeping me. Mm -hmm. But I didn't want to stay because that left me with nobody. Right. Only her, only her, <laughs> only his, <Yes. laughs> his, his secretary. I bet you didn't see much of her yet. No, we didn't <laughs> see much of her. <laughs> Well, um, Dennis, would you like a cup of coffee, a cup of tea? Or? No, actually. Because I just want to get lunch.
Russ can go make a tuna fish sandwich and, and do some writing. Because I have to write my column. I'm late with my next installment. <laughs> I'm very nervous about it. So I'm sure I forgot to ask you a lot of things. Well, you didn't ask me over there. <laughs> Can I, you want me to bring more wood to the porch while I'm here? You don't need any more? Well, I got some there. Thank you. I also forgot to bring more slow cave